Good afternoon, Allison. Hey there. How are you? So good to see you. It's I'm good. It's fantastic to see <laughs> you. you. And it's fantastic to see all of you, yeah, really. Thank, thank you. you. Um, when I was asked to do this, I immediately tried to figure out how I could because the gift of being able to talk to Allison about her work was one that I knew I did not want to pass up. So I'm really glad <laughs> that you. this all could happen, that we could do this. And as Kim said, you know, I've had the real privilege of knowing Allison's work for a long time. Um, I will correct one small thing, only because I have to give honor to the people who came before me. I am not the founder of the Studio <laughs> Museum. It was founded in 68, but yeah, I have been um, director and chief curator of the Studio Museum for the last 20 years. So I, I can't believe um, that's been 20 years. Isn't that something, Allison? That's incredible, but I know. amazing. 20 years. <laughs> so, um, but... Uh, the Studio Museum in Harlem has long been home to Allison's work, both my, my time, but also the curators and directors who came before me. And Allison was an artist in resident in our program in 1983. And the studio in the Studio Museum's name comes from the fact that from our very founding year in 1968, we have had three artists every year who have studios in the museum building, who make their work mm -hmm. in the museum, live their life in and around the museum in Harlem, and then at the end of that year, there is an exhibition that presents mm -hmm. their work, and it's what really is at the heart of the museum, so it's always an honor as well to have Allison as part of that incredible legacy. Um, but then, as a curator, I had the real privilege of doing, uh, making an exhibition with Allison in 1992 when I was the curator at the Whitney Museum's branch at Philip Morris. Philip Morris and right. Allison made an amazing site-specific installation called Slow Boat, a right. beautiful meditation mm -hmm. on life and passage and mm -hmm. grieving and transitions. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful work, a very evocative work, one that I you know, can see when mm -hmm. I close my eyes mm -hmm. exactly nice. <laughs> um, to th all these years later. Really fantastic. And then in 1993, Allison was part of the 1993 Whitney Biennial. I was a co-curator, right. and then in 1994, I made an exhibition called Blackmail that Allison also yes, well. work was in. So there has just been a, a way in which um, Allison's work is formative to many of the curatorial projects that define me. So with well, that, I want to say, you know, as someone, and I should also say, because I say this to you all the time, but, you know, Allison made a beautiful sculpture called Swing Low. Um, mm -hmm. that was installed on 120th Street in St. Nicholas Avenue in 2008, exactly the same, almost the same month um, that I moved into the building behind it. So I see oh. Allison's, <laughs> yes, I look down on her keep an from eye my on building. For me. I oh, do, I do. Didn't I send you, they, she got power washed this summer. I meant to send you that oh, video. It's no, on my phone. Like posing her down. I looked outside and they were doing, and I went over, of course, acting like, you know, I'm the you know, director of all things yeah. in Harlem. I walked over. I was like, right. you know what you're doing? Like, what are you doing? And it's a program that the city actually has instituted of care of all the public oh, works. So it's a great. I know that's a challenge. It's for a them. challenge, yeah, and they have this cities. great group of young artists and art oh, preparators really? and handlers who oh, are a team, and they go around. And so they were attending um, to yeah, her. Yeah, she needs to be hosed down, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so it was really fantastic, you know, to to live and to be able to literally live with your oh, work. That's great. So I want to start and first say. Congratulations. This is such a beautiful installation of work that give us this mm -hmm. sense of printing and printmaking in your um, work, in your practice, but mm -hmm. also to congratulate you on the booth at Freeze. That was just oh, an incredible group of sculptures, super excited. evocative, <laughs> incredibly powerful at once, so much um, a, a reflection of this vocabulary that's uniquely yours, hmm. but also one where it gives so much context to the way in which your approach to the figure has so mm -hmm. much resonance in a mm -hmm. generation of artists that are working today. That is just starting, yeah, that's yeah, right. that is really and, incredible. And yeah. it's all in your work and you see it huh. in the work <laughs> of so many. So Thank can you, you talk First, let's talk about the installation at Freeze, and can you just talk about that group of sculpture and the themes um, that okay. you were thinking about? Yeah, I'm assuming many of you have seen the show. Well, but, but if they uh, haven't, this is the preview. Right. In order to go to the fair <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> right, and see right. what is that work. And um, I don't know. I mean, I guess the show that I, that I had done here prior, which was um, Topsy yeah. Turvy, where the little mm -hmm. figure in the back came out mm -hmm. of that, and that, for me, you know, we were talking about, we, we did a cassette called Angry Songs for Angry Times. I was just really angry. Mm -hmm. And so when it came around to kind of doing 
the next show. And the idea why I called it Topsy Turvy was that I, I knew there was this dark stuff and at the end I wanted to have some sort of sign that all of these things we were experiencing mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, police brutality and all these things, that there was going to be a turning point. You could start to see, the, you know, the, the change on the horizon. Unfortunately, that didn't happen wow. last year. Wow. I'm not sure. It's looking pretty dark as we move mm -hmm. forward into the next year or so. So, um, so I really wanted to kind of get back to looking at having some levity to the work, you know, still feeling very similar in terms of these really, they're all very heavy themed sort of things, but also to kind of bring some joy and some celebration mm -hmm. into the work. And so, you know, I think the work on one hand challenges, you know, sort of what uh, women of color and women not of color have been experiencing in terms of, you know, sexism and misogynism and all that stuff. So in some ways talking about that, but also really talking about the kitchen and the place of the kitchen and how, you know, my mother's generation, you know, like the women's building, they were all like, you know, let's tear the walls off the kitchen. We're getting rid of the kitchen. We're not going to be, we're taking our, ap we're burning our aprons. But for me, you know, I, I guess, and I'm not sure if everyone else's family is like that, but, you know, the kitchen was a place, well, one, it was my mother's studio, and we did occasionally eat in the kitchen and cook in the kitchen, but, you know, it was like where we did our hair with hot combs, and it was where we did our homework and our valentines, and, you know, it was just really mm -hmm. the place, and I think my kitchen table now is my office sort of thing because it's a space. So I kind of wanted to talk about kind of like these two polar ends of the kitchen, the title of the exhibition is Chaos in the Kitchen, but really sort of embrace all the wonderful things that happen in that mm -hmm. space as well. Mm -hmm. so. But can you talk about the title? Because I found the title intriguing and I took it to mean that as has been the case in your work in the past, the, your female figures are so powerful. Right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I felt like they were causing chaos in the kitchen. They are causing chaos. I mean, <laughs> if my mother caught me lying naked on the dining room table, right. I'd be in right. big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, yeah, and I think it's kind of like taking that space and turning it into other things and, and in power, having that be a space of power. I mean, uh, and using those utensils, you know, for cooking and nurturing mm -hmm. also as weapons. Right. Um, um, kitchen Amazon basically is wearing a girdle mm. like Hippolyta in uh, the story of Hercules, the queen of the Amazon. And it's also kind of playing with Josephine Baker's banana mm -hmm. skirt as well. And so this girdle of these cast iron things, which they're incredibly heavy when we, mm -hmm. you know, because the skillet weighs what, like two to three pounds. Mm -hmm. When you get 10 of them, yeah. it's like really heavy skirt. And so this idea that it's kind of this protection and that these things that we use every day, these mm -hmm. tools that we use every day can also somehow um, uh, fend for ourselves. Actually, the title is an old title from a piece, you know, with my hair obsessed uh, history of work, mm -hmm. you know, and the kitchen is of course mm -hmm. like this little curly, difficult part that my mother would just cut off because it would just get all nappy and snarled and we'd just get rid of it all together. But, um, you know, and so when I had done a figure called uh, A Head Chaos on the Kitchen, which is probably, you know, around the time I was at the studio museum, mm -hmm. thereafter I was doing these busts and yeah. things. And so she's got this crazy wild hair and all this stuff is stuck in her hair and that, you know, this kind of crazy, wild, kinky, stubborn hair was somehow her biographer, that all these things were kind of embedded in that. And so um, so I've taken, you know, I've come back and stolen my own tile, okay. title and, and started talking about how these things in chaos in terms of like the, uh, the place of making. Mm. So it, it has a creative space. So not only are you cooking, you're also collaborating, you're making things, you're thinking about things. So I kind of like that idea that, you know, all this stuff comes out of that space. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> And is that how you think of your practice? You know, when you're working, do you feel that you are working in a singular manner or there's a collaborative aspect to it that you're bringing in these ideas in it's a way that like in cooking? Right, right I mean, yeah. I mean, it definitely mm -hmm. feels like collaborative. I mean, you know, because so many of the influences are either music or food. Yeah. You know, you kind of really see that come into the work. But, um, uh, and yeah, and, and then research and these ideas. So the, really, you know, it's hard to say where one idea will come from. I mean, really, basically, the, the key figure in that was 
um, Kitchen Amazon, and that came out of kind of this idea of this girdle and then looking at the Amazon's girdle and all that. So then that, that took me all in that direction. Um, and then also the odalisque of the figure lying on the table. So, you know, so there's art historical stuff. There's, you know, classical Greek mythology that comes into the work. And then, you know, for example, with the uh, um, hot cones, you know, they also kind of reckon back to Luba, the art of Luba and these kind of the practice in uh, West Africa to have tools, functioning tools, utilitarian objects turn into these kind of sacred objects or objects of um, that really kind of talk about uh, royalty or status sort of things. And so then kind of looking back and having these sort of American tools. Uh, and so the, they were tools of labor from the Topsy Turvy show. And then I yeah. happed upon some great old hot combs and mm -hmm. uh, kind of played on that idea. Mm -hmm. And the idea of those were that, you know, they're, they're haint, so they're these little spirits that the handles turn into and that this notion that you know, if you're combing your hair and taking all of that wild beautiful phonetic energy that's part of that texture and you know that that energy has to go somewhere and so mm -hmm. she kind of absorbs all of that wildness the more you want to kind of anglify your hairstyle and kind of tamper it down and make it behave a certain way that she's going to soak that all up mm -hmm. so they're all these wild girls on, on mm -hmm. combs on the combs <laughs> yeah yeah. You know, Allison, your practice has taken a trajectory through the various use of materials. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it feels like the materials tell you in some ways um, sort of where you might be going. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about um, this sort of the, the, the way in which you've used materials? We're sitting in front of a piece with the oh, sort right. of, you know, this ceiling, so very, tin, uh -huh, right? uh -huh. very early yeah, work. Yeah. But even now as you discuss, you know, the sort of skirt with the skillets, the way in which you use materials yeah. is, you know, incredibly impactful for the way in which we understand your work. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little well, bit I about Well, I think a lot of that, I mean, and a lot of that really harkens back to the Studio Museum because I think I was 20, well, 1983? I don't know, I can't do the math, but I was 20-something mm -hmm. at the time. It was before I got married, so 25 mm -hmm. or something. And, um, you know, so I was living in Chelsea, but taking the subway up and then walking across. And, of course, in the 80s, everything was being torn out, mm -hmm. and so there was tons and tons of ceiling tin. And actually... I think the last few remnants of linoleum from Harlem mm -hmm. are in the pieces, the two pieces that are at. They've, they've traveled with me for wow. 30 years. Uh, but, um, you know, it was just, I guess I was just really astounded by, one, feeling very young and very naive and having grown up in, you know, as a hippie in Laurel Canyon um, and now living this, you know, what was a very sort of gritty lifestyle in New York in the 80s. And... Um, you know, just somehow those materials really kind of welcomed me or sort of informed me as to what the history of that space was. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, I think one of my favorite piece of, pieces of tin came out of a bar that had all these phone, it was in a phone booth in the bar. And so it had all these things scribbled on them and, you know, layers of paint and, mm -hmm. you know, they chipped off. Yeah. And so I love that. And, you know, I think of... Um, you know, just the ceiling tins looking on, down on these tenements that were built in 1910, basically. And, you know, they had seen, you know, the, you know, different populations, you know, Harlem having been a largely Jewish mm -hmm. community, yeah. then becoming black, and now mm -hmm. becoming something else altogether mm -hmm. is really kind of, you know, that they were witnessing all these things. And so, um, yeah, so I just started dragging all that stuff. It was great when I had the studio, I didn't have to drag it so far, but then later I'd have to drag it all the way down to my house on the subway everywhere, like, what? Mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, and then, you know, and so, and you know, all the skillets are like used. I love the really crusty ones that, you know, someone's grandmother cooked, you know, fried chicken mm -hmm. in that thing forever or whatever. Or, and you know, that, that, that it's lived and it has a history, you know, I mean, it's sort of, um, it's embodied with those right. things, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and it seems that embodiment mm -hmm. um, then is what allows us as viewers to begin to understand the way in which you imbue these figures with a mm -hmm. history, both mm -hmm. the references, but also the sense of what their story is. Yeah. Can you talk about the role of narrative in your work? You know, I yeah, mean, I've got these long stories for everything, right. but no, it's true. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think when I was really young, we used to go to the, um, 
Renaissance fair, pleasure fair, and I would make these dolls and they would have these little stories with them. And I really feel that kind of inve inventing, I was never really comfortable as a writer per se, mm -hmm. but I love the idea that these objects could maybe not have a real specific story, but that, you know, looking for different clues, like for him, you can kind of create this narrative, you know, between, you know, a, you know, a laurel branch and a martini <laughs> and his levitating hat, you would kind of get a sense as to who he was or what his powers mm -hmm. were. And to, so they're not necessarily dictated, but I love the idea that it's kind of like these clues or these, you know, it almost becomes like a poetry yes. that is very open. Mm -hmm. And I think then that it becomes something that, you know, as each different person with each different experience comes to the work can kind of find their own personal narrative within those things. Mm -hmm. And hence using objects like frying pans, I mean, who here... I know Teflon's kind of ruined it, but who here hasn't had some really amazing thing cooked out of a black skillet sort of mm -hmm. thing? And you know that, so, you know, even though, you know, my work is really dealing largely with African American experience and those eating, dining, mm -hmm. communal, you know, healthcare mm -hmm. rituals, that I think there's a lot of that is echoed in, in non black experiences as well. Right. So, right. It has a resonance around mm -hmm. many different cultural right. experiences, though there is such specificity to right. yours, right? Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where I think the work um, really has so much power, right? That it's deeply, deeply specific, but then that opens out. Yeah, yeah so and, you know, it's it's yeah. really about our shared experiences mm -hmm. and how we can find where we, you know, our our lives overlap and our, you know, we all basically have the same desires, <laughs> right? You know, and want to be prosperous and happy, and you know, have you know people around us happy as well. Right. Well, yeah. some of us feel that way. Right. Some right. folks don't, but. Right. Right. <laughs> You know, so as I began, you know, in talking, you have worked uh, around the figure for your right. entire mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what drew you to figuration specifically, right. and how, over the trajectory of your career, this working with the body, and maybe particularly even the female, the black female body, mm -hmm. what that has mm -hmm. meant for mm -hmm. you in your work? Yeah, you know, I think when I was in grad school uh, at Otis, I was doing largely totally abstract but still really interested in sort of the spirit. I think it was kind of like bouncing between, um, uh, I don't know, I'm having a blank, like uh, Albers and his use of color and, and Rothko and uh, tantric art and this mm -hmm. idea that these colors could kind of create, um, you know, this sense of movement and this sense that would actually draw you in and somehow mm -hmm. affect you through your retina mm -hmm. to your heart sort mm -hmm. of thing. And so um, I was doing that, and then my father gave me a set of tools, uh, carving tools, and I got like a little four by four piece of wood. And that, I should say that my undergraduate work at Scripps College when studying with Samela Lewis, I was looking at, um, I did my um, thesis on self-taught African-American artists. Mm -hmm. So I'd always really loved that work and loved it specifically because it was really passionate that it was, you know, they had no sort of monetary goal. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about getting an art exhibit. They made it because they had to. And you look at like Edmondson, William mm -hmm. Edmondson stuff, whose work is so incredibly powerful and just simple and concise. And so all of a sudden I really kind of, you know, ha having again, looking at Edmondson's work and realizing, you know, kind of just what a, um, what a visceral immediate response there is to a body and that it is something that we all understand. And even, so I feel like I'm talking about things that are outside of that, but the body is so adept at expressing that mm. just by the, you know, the shift of the shoulder or the slump of the shoulder or the bow of the head can tell you so much about what that, figure is experiencing. And so, you know, initially all of them had, you know, cavities, yes. which I would cram full of stuff, like Subway Preacher, which was, you know, yeah. a portrait of a man going up and down, and then for the piece that was in the black male. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, actually, when I first moved to New York, um, I think the work was half and half in terms of male and female. Mm -hmm. And that really shifted when I had when I birthed the baby, mm -hmm. and I was all of a sudden like, this machine is too amazing. We're just going to talk about yeah, girls' bodies. Yeah, right. uh, you know, and it just, and I also mm -hmm. felt, you know, I used to, you know, I think I used to offend people because I would say, well, the male pieces were always very about very cerebral things, mm -hmm. like things I learned. And maybe because that wasn't a body that I had experienced. Um, someone, 
I, I guess they had taken it like, oh, well, you're just saying men are intelligent and smart right. and that women aren't thinking. Mm -hmm. That wasn't my intention. It's just that I had never had, you know, I don't physically understand and experience what that body right. is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so then, again, like when I had Kyle, it was just like, oh, this is really incredible. And so... Um, yeah, the guys slowly started slipping mm -hmm. off the radar. They come back every once in a while, mm -hmm. but um, and they're usually about something outside of you know this real. Well, we've got our two fellows yeah. here, and mm -hmm. um, and he would have been kind of prior to that. Mm -hmm. A lot of those early male figures, I was really fascinated with the idea of urban shaman, and you know, kind of looking at the sort of history of black males in Harlem mm -hmm. and the music scene, which was predominantly male yeah. at that time mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. so I think that really kind of bounced off of that experience and also just being so blown away about, you know, being in, you know, walking the streets in Harlem where all this amazing stuff, mm -hmm. you know, had. I mean, mm -hmm. still was happening, mm -hmm. but, you know, it was even then starting to be eroded. Mm -hmm. um, to some respect, mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. eroded. I mean, by um, you know, the closing of great clubs and um, the opening of the Gap okay. <laughs> and things like that. We have a Whole Foods on the corner, a Whole of Lenox Foods, Avenue, oh my God. and 125th, a right. half block from the museum. And at what cost? Eminem, you know, Soul Food's yeah. gone, right? right? Or whatever. Exactly. So exactly, <laughs> you, you'll live longer, but maybe not as much fun. Right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> No, well, no, thank you for that, because I think that trajectory is important um, to understand, mm -hmm, you know, sort mm -hmm. of where the, the body generally, but the male body in particular, and how the female body has come to define um, the way in which you mm. created these, you know, archetypes, mm -hmm, really, in mm -hmm, many ways, mm -hmm. out of the female figure. Can you speak a bit about, you know, what I think often in the art world can be this divide between outsider or self-taught whatever mm -hmm, we want to call mm -hmm, it, art, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. particularly by African-Americans, and contemporary art mm -hmm. in whatever right. form. Yeah, yeah. Because it feels that you have always been a great advocate for a more synergistic idea to making and mm -hmm. have always elevated the idea of what those practitioners did mm -hmm. as being sort of significant in its intellectual force and power, not mm -hmm. only, say, as it's understood quite often as coming right, from the kind of intuitive or something. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, and I think, um, well, now now that more of it is being seen mm -hmm. and more of there, you know, that there is crossover, like, you know, amazing artists like Lonnie Holly mm -hmm. who are really just, well, he's incredible on mm -hmm. so many levels mm -hmm. sort of things. Um, but, you know, and I think partially also because you know, I was fortunate to, enough at the time to be showing Phyllis Kine, who always kind of like wanted to obliterate those divisions. Mm -hmm. And she was showing Cole Scott right. alongside with Wolfie and all these amazing artists. And, you know, I felt, and, and I think similar also with when I was showing with um, at Jan Baum Gallery when I first graduated from school and her kind of gallery being devoted in part to African art and mm. and also not making, you know, that, oh, this is this other thing and this is right. this is the real art in this gallery sort of thing. And so I always respected both of them. I mean, you know, they've both moved on and have passed, but I both really respected their ideas that, you know, we don't need to kind of, you know, claim these things or put these things in boxes. Um, and I think now, like you said, that there people are really understanding this work more, that it's not just someone that doesn't know how to draw or is uneducated and naive, um, but that the work is really powerful and really mm -hmm. smart and really intentional mm -hmm. in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it's interesting because my daughter, uh, well, Maddie, is now working at a place called Tierra del Sol, which mm -hmm. is a studio that facilitates um, um, well, just facilitates a studio practice of adults on the spectrum. Mm. And the work is so amazing and they're so sophisticated and, you know, some of them are nonverbal, but, you know, so much gets said through their work and stuff like that. So I'm really appreciating that, you know, that this work is now getting some sort of uh, recognition and they're not constantly putting... But, you know, I think, and, and as a result of the way I work, one, <clears throat> that... You know, the work is kind of funky. I feel every once in a while I step back, I'm like, oh my God, you know, I should go back and do some life drawing classes because it's really, but, um, but that it's not, you know, that the work, well, where is it, well, where is it going to go with that? That um, because I basically, you know, 
taught myself how to carve because mm-hmm. I didn't take any sculpture classes mm-hmm. and I don't know what I was doing tripping while I was in school and didn't bother taking mm-hmm. life drawing or any of those things. But um, in some way, I think, you know, the lack of a real sort of um, trained, you know, that training sometimes um, inhibits your ability to be expressive. And so, you know, when I create, especially some of these little girls that come out of these little two by two blocks of wood, you know, you kind of to cram them within that parameter and their bodies do things that are maybe not physically possible, but then the same time that that contortion and that sort of bending the backwards of a limb talks about, you know, what they're enduring, that they're kind of like suffering or struggling, Mm -hmm. or they're dancing aesthetically and defying what the physical abilities of the body are, so one way or the other of that. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's Mm -hmm. uh, part of that experience too. So we're sitting in this room with a lot of your prints. What has what place has printmaking had in your practice and your career? Well, you know, I I was reared underneath print presses. Uh, my mother was at Long Beach when I think I was two or three years old, and when she couldn't find someone to watch me, I was being dragged to the studios, and so um, and then you know she had her studio, her prints, you know, acid. We had a press at home. I mean, it was more often a something to play with a pirate ship or something like that. But um, so it was always around and I did a little bit in college, but um, it wasn't really, um, I think the problem for me with printmaking is I'm really messy and I don't like making things more than once. And so, you know, I was really happy when the art came to, when the career came to a point where I was being invited by print studios so I could go and I could make the plates and we could, you know, plan how these things would go, and then I could leave, and they would actually right. edition them. Right, right. So, right. Um, yeah. Right. So, but you know, I think what it came out of initially, I think really some of the early early wood woodcuts were just because there was always wood on the street, like mm-hmm. you know, plywood. Actually, I would take um, old like drawers or things that would be solid wood, not ply, and then I had these amazing wooden chisels that my father had given me. So. Mm-hmm. It was something I could do at home. I didn't have to have acid. I didn't have to have an aquatint box. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to have a press. You could mm-hmm. just hand rub them all. And so that really was really um, amazing to me. And then when I first moved to New York, um, Bob Blackburn had his studio on, at that point I think it was 18th and we were living mm-hmm. on 21st. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and he was really, this is this amazing printmaker that uh, the it was called the Printmaker's Workshop yes. in New York, which is still going on. Uh, Bob has since passed, but he would just invite artists to come and use this facility. And you know, you would pay, you could pay dues if you wanted to, and then he, you know, he would sell paper or whatnot. You could buy your plates from him, so he was able to kind of maintain it. And he was also additioning works of other artists, and his own work was really amazing in his own right, sort of thing. So that was really. Wonderful, and the, also the na- amazing thing with printmaking is that for me, I mean, um, I have one studio assistant, but primarily the studio is a very solitary experience, but when you're in a print studio, you've got mm-hmm. other people working, mm-hmm. and you're sharing, you're sharing ideas, and you're physically moving things around, and so I really love that, and it's a real mm-hmm. sort of different process for me, and I mm-hmm. really I think we're going to be going, I'm going to be going up this spring to Tandem Press, where mm. a lot of the works here are from. Yeah. yeah, and what's amazing with Tandem is that it's a university press, and so you're working with students that are learning how to be master printers, and it's just a really rich, wonderful experience to be around young minds, and, and this, you know, press that has been going on for, I, don't, I think it started in the early 70s mm. sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, so I really love that and it's kind of like a cleansing of a palette you know I know after you know I've done this I shouldn't say this in front of Peter and Kimberly and all that but I always kind of come to when I work really hard on putting the show together I kind of come to this sort of like you know hit a wall basically because mm-hmm. you're like okay it's, it's always the what's next sort of thing yes. and it does come around eventually but sometimes it's scary mm-hmm. in how long it takes for that to come around so um, you know it's nice to have the print process to kind of maybe re-examine some of those pieces mm-hmm. um, and see what they become. And then, it's, and then it's kind of, yeah, it's a closing of one door and an opening of another, and it usually leads me into a new body of mm-hmm. work, yeah. 
Yeah, because it's interesting to see the relationships with some of the prints and bodies of work. So here with the topsy-turvy sculpture, mm -hmm. but seeing mm -hmm. the prints that you made out of that. So mm -hmm. is that a way to sort of fill out the narratives around certain bodies of work, to have the prints exist as not simply an extension, but as an integral part? Well, I think, you know, I mean, the, the, the painting plane allows so much more to happen mm -hmm. than the sculpture plane. And I mean, well, well, this one, I didn't actually take you, make use of that ability to have things in the background per se. Mm -hmm. But um, for her, you know, all of a sudden I could really talk about, you know, the, for um, white guys, you know, the idea of the piece was that she was invisible, you know, that she was a light-skinned, um, you know, slave within the house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that she, you know, was invisible, basically, because she wasn't dark skinned and she wasn't kind of like, you know, she was kind of between. And also often those, those um, women and men were the offsprings of the owners right. of the house mm -hmm. or thing. And so, you know, it was kind of like she was kind of like the spy in the house. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then it was great to be able to do this and actually have this wallpaper that um, I created this wallpaper that was you know a motif of cotton bowls mm -hmm. so her camouflage cotton bowls kind of blend into that but also mm -hmm. you see through her skin and you can see kind of like you know where she just kind of disappears I love that that it allows me to kind of do things and like actually have cotton growing around a figure which would be really hard to do in a in the sculpture and then the figures that are actually in, in water as well mm -hmm. um, so it allows me to kind of expand and put them in a place mm -hmm. Um, but I also just love it for the practical reason that it's easy for people, it's affordable. Mm. And, you know, I think that's really important to me to have the work be accessible to young, you know, starting collectors mm -hmm. and, you know, even people that are not quite sure if they want to collect art. It's a nice way to kind of get their foot in the door sort of thing. Or mm -hmm. I know some people collect nothing but prints, mm -hmm. you know, and have really amazing mm -hmm. massive collections mm -hmm. of nothing but, but, mm -hmm. um, because the sculptures, you know, I mean, it takes a little bit of time to do them, and they're not as affordable as, you know. I just don't want to, like, cut out a body of people. I don't want it, the work to become so elite that it's mm -hmm. inaccessible for, for other people to own. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the other half of that equation yeah. for printmaking. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking yeah. about just ways to have the work in the world yeah. in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, that, you know, they can be in college collections mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It's mm -hmm. kind of nice. Well, there's the wonderful exhibition of the prints that's traveling. So right, So, again, yeah. another way that the work can be out Yeah, in the that world. it's out and it's easy to pack them up and move mm -hmm. them around. And because they're, you know... No, often the work goes into private collections, these sculptures, and whereas my collectors are usually super sweet and really generous mm -hmm. in terms of lending them, at the same time, you know, it's a lot of wear and tear to have a piece on the road for a year and a half, so, mm -hmm. um, so it's nice if, in that yeah. respect as well. Yeah. To have that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to open it up for you all to have questions, so this is a warning to get ready if you have questions. <laughs> Start pondering. But before um, I do that, I want um, just to widen the lens a bit, and what's inspiring you right now when you go into the studio? What, what's, mm. you know, sort of making you think differently about your work or think differently about the way in which the work should live in the world? Well... You know, so much of the work really came out of, again, like finding things. And then, you know, they just sit in the studio until it reveals, they reveal their purpose to me at mm -hmm. some point. I'm not kind of like, and that's what I miss about New York, that you would walk down the street and you'd be tripping over materials all the time. And I find myself scavenging stuff when I go back there and trying to figure out how to get back to L.A. Mm -hmm. um, so the work doesn't necessarily come out of the objects that way that they used to just, uh, you know, the sort of serendipity of what presents itself to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I think like many of us are really sort of burdened by what's happening in the world, in the United States and the world mm -hmm. in terms of politics. And so, you know, I'm on one hand really um, troubled and my mind is occupied with these things a lot. Um, and trying, you know, I think that the, the, the thing is to really find a way to talk about those things in a way that kind of pushes forward towards a resolution as opposed to always just, you know, damning our lives and being miserable. Although sometimes it's a, it's a hard thing to do. So I guess, you know, I'll pursue that, you know. I mean, so much of my, you know, I always thought it was funny, but you could really time, you could really chart my career according to, um, 
you know, the the age of my children because mm. so much of the work, you know, I think Maddie posed for my first little girls when mm -hmm. she was five. And so a lot of that, you know, and then mm -hmm. a lot of the work, you know, 10 years ago was, you know, about menopause. <laughs> and then a lot of the work was about empty nests. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now that I've done my empty nest and, you know, kind of pushed on beyond that, it's, it's always a mystery as to what's going to be next. Mm -hmm. So, and I mm -hmm. think that's what's exciting as an artist, you mm -hmm. know, that you don't really know what's going to be mm -hmm. next and that, you know, we get bored with doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, sometimes the work is cyclical. Um, you know, I come back, I had done a Topsy figure. In fact, I just saw the collector today, um, you know, which would have been 20 years ago because Maddie was four years old mm -hmm. and she modeled for mm -hmm. me sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I come back to these ideas mm -hmm. and these things, but hopefully the, the ideas and that are propelling them are always different or, yeah. you know, so mm -hmm. yeah. Thank so who you. knows? But before we move on, I just want to thank you so much, Thelma, for one, coming here today oh. and doing this, but also, you know, I mean, when you listed like the Black Male Show and the show at the Whitney Philip Morris, and then, you know, I remember our conversation in some coffee shop in Park Slope mm -hmm. about the 93 Biennial, mm -hmm. and um, I just really appreciate, you know, so much support. Thank you so much. Oh, you are welcome. <laughs> so, now, now we can open it up. It's a privilege, really. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Right here. So, Thelma actually touched a couple times on some words like narrative and language, and I just was sort of curious to maybe expand on how much you actually, you know, sort of think about your, the literature of your own work prior to making it. Sort of like, do you have a story that you construct prior to these things? Because so many of them do really, like, touch you know, almost mm -hmm. like, the, you know, the mm -hmm. copacetic work mm -hmm. back here mm -hmm. sort of, mm -hmm. uh, are very, like, Nella Larson type. Mm -hmm. Right, right, with the, so I have my passing one? Uh -huh. the, like, the sort of backstory literature is important to you prior to actually creating a work? I think the work, I mean, that in terms of reading is really, uh, you know, research is a big part of the work. And so I think, you know, people like Nella Larson and, you know, uh, um, yeah, so a lot of that reading, mm -hmm. and then again, music, and you know, the, the, the words in terms of blues and all that mm -hmm. stuff is also a really big component um, to it. You know, I think, like many creative young people, you know, when we would write all our mad, passionate poetry in junior high school, mm -hmm. and then you, ha you had the misfortune of looking at it again, <laughs> maybe a year later, and you're like, oh my God, and you burned everything you ever wrote sort of thing, mm -hmm. and um, that we never gave ourselves permission mm -hmm. to continue making these ridiculous, absurd mm -hmm. writings. Um, um, so I think, you know, I kind of fell under that sort of... Um, I wouldn't say spell, that mm -hmm. dispel, mm -hmm. that I could write sort of thing. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> but you know, for me, and I think, you know, still really interested in poetry and poets, and I've since been really fortunate to work with some amazing poets mm -hmm. in the last couple of years um, to the present, um, that, um, you know, again, kind of these cobbling together of materials and stuff like that, I think creates a certain poetry that those textures become very literary, but I never really think in terms of spelling them out. And while I may have, you know, the stories in my mind, they're not necessarily, you know, that apparent. And I, and again, I don't also don't want to kind of like spell it out for other people in a weird sort of way. So I, I hope that the work, you know, inspires us to make our own poems up about all these pieces or things, our own stories. So, yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I wanted to bring up two thoughts that you had <coughs> separate questions. One was about collaboration, one was about materials. And the reason is that it seems to me that your process is somehow collaborative with your materials. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Your materials mm -hmm. have a voice. Mm -hmm. And how, how aware of you are? Of that, are you? Is it something you're deliberately doing? Sometimes I feel like you're like a director bringing out the best performance from your material mm -hmm. and nurturing that yeah. performance. Well, you conjure a lot in them, right? You know, there's a way yeah. that 
you let the sort of alchemy of what they are and what they speak to and what they mean mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. you know open up and that and seems to be again a through line yeah and then it's not always I don't always feel like I'm the director I don't always feel like I'm in control mm. per se because you know some of these materials you know I've got many scars on my hands you know they bite back um, and um, sometimes they just kind of dictate the way they want to go and the things they you know I there's that you know, sort of is now kind of cliche and corny in terms of, you know, you know, releasing the figure from the block of wood sort of thing. But in truth, you know, that shape of that wood really does have an influence in terms of what can be come, come out of that space. And so, um, and I guess the work is always, you know, carving wise has always been reductive. But, you know, I'm working with chainsaws and it's hot and it's dirty and there's luckily no um, injurious slips of the chains up, but there are, for myself, but many a figure have had, like, their waist winnowed a little too small, and, you know, mm. and so, you know, there's this kind of play with those materials, mm. and because they are really a physical wrestling, and, you know, I think um, part of the, the chaos in the kitchen show is really kind of talking to my sort of um, alliance and respect for the... Um, uh, the African diasporic deity Ogun mm -hmm. and about, you know, kind of looks like this sort of idea of bending metal and how the metal will only bend so far sort of thing and how, um, yeah, there's kind of this wrestling and wrangling with these materials and they'll only take it to, to such a point and then, you know, you've got to kind of back up and relinquish some control at the same time. So um, I really love that physicality and um, you know, I kind of really see those being the two halves of my practice, really, and kind of, you know, I look at Yamaya, this goddess of waters, and sort of healing and creativity and thought and patience as this sort of like, you know, how I think of things and think of ideas, but then when it comes to executing them, it's this very brute force, you know, wrestling the stuff to the ground sort of activity. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. And I, and I love that, you know, I just, it's yeah it's like wrestling it's fun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes um i thought of this question uh, you had mentioned printmaking being accessible to maybe younger collectors or people who aren't quite sure how to start collecting and i, I this is actually a question for both of you i hope that you would like to answer for me mm -hmm. sure this, but um, just thinking about the intersection between art and consumption in general and how there's an ever-changing relationship between creating art and sort of ca uh, capitalism. And from your incredibly rich careers, how you see that evolving or not evolving and the implications that it may or may not have sort of on younger producers of art, collectors of art, just sort of how that intersection of consumption and art creation looks from where you both sit. Hmm. You take that first. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, great question. So, you know, I am a curator who's also a museum director. And in that regard, I feel very strongly about the idea of the art object not being one that can be fixed in ownership. Right? Um, yes, at any given moment in its life, it might be owned by people, but I like to think of the relationship to objects as being one of stewardship. Right? Mm -hmm. So an artist makes an object, it's, let, it's in an exhibition, it perhaps is acquired by an individual or maybe by an institution, but maybe that individual keeps it for some time and then it ends up in a museum, but that it is a cycle and not one that is just fixed between the act of the making of the object and the acquiring of it. That there's a whole ecology in which mm -hmm. the object exists and many different people with responsibility for it in the public That's trust, true. right? With the idea that all of this is to the end of making it possible for these objects to live in the world. Not just now, though the now is fantastic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But for the future. And as a museum director, I see that, right? I have the great sort of privilege of seeing what it meant for people in 1968 who had the idea that there should be a museum devoted to black artists. And not simply that this should be a physical structure, but one that had a collection. Mm -hmm. And they began without the kind of resources that we would now consider necessary for, you right. know, the yeah, collecting absolutely. of art. <laughs> yes. um, but with great ambition and a great, great, great sense of the importance of what it meant to keep 
and save outside of the art histories of that moment. They were doing this for the future. So I really believe that, you know, that artists making work, curators, you know, in institutions, galleries, that all of us have to not just think about this moment, but the moment of the future. And when we think of that, it changes, in some ways, maybe, how we consider this issue that now we talk about as such a small fixed state, which is the consumption of works of art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and a couple of things. I mean, I think, again, with the Studio Museum is really amazing in terms of them, you know, being a museum and a collecting museum and an exhibiting museum, but also that they are supporting artists in the making of the art and, you know, that, you know, many artists have, you know, donated pieces. Of that's how some of the really early collection was, mm -hmm. came out of the Studio You know, all of the artists in residence would mm -hmm. leave a piece behind and, you know, I mean, and such, you know, from the get-go, I think David Hammonds was one of the really earliest mm -hmm. artists, so, you know, way ahead of the curve on some of these things. So, um, so I think that's really wonderful, and I like that idea, that relationship of a, a space that shows but also helps foster the creation mm -hmm. is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and that can also be, you know, facilities or museums or kunst halls that you know, are able to help an artist create an installation, or you think of something like Socrates Park, yes. where, you know, they, you know, this is Mark de Suvero's space in uh, Long Island City, and, you know, that um, it's a space that, on one hand, you know, artists, I think it was the first time I was able to make a large piece because they had cranes, and they had, you know, a crew with shovels, they knew how to dig holes, they knew how to tell us how to, you know, teach me how to make the art so it wouldn't fall over and kill someone sort of thing. And yeah. so this really kind of practical, wonderful advice and that he had this equipment and that this was like a really horrible kind of disused lot that he really turned into. I mean, the park is really astounding mm -hmm. now and it keeps, mm -hmm. and then that kind of, it also fostered um, people in the neighborhood to come and help work. And then it's also has art classes for kids in the neighborhood and movies for the, it's just, it's grown yeah. into this great thing. But again, mm -hmm. so it had a similar sort of mm -hmm. birth in this idea that we make art, we show art, but we're also fostering the making. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, I really admire that sort of example. And I remember one time I was in some interview and someone said to me, it's like they looked at me and they said, so um, one last question, if you wanted to own a piece of art, what would you want to own? And it, it, it was a panel, so they asked everyone, and then someone was like, oh, well, I would really love a Picasso. And I'm like, <laughs> and, you know, and I was like, you know, there's a lot of art that I really love, but the idea of owning it somehow feels like it's taking outside of the sort of grander sort of space unless it is a museum where the public is welcome to come in or unless it's a collector and a collection that invites the public to come in and see the work. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I, there's a lot of work out there that I, I really would love to own, but on some hands it just feels very selfish. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I shouldn't be saying this in front of collectors. No. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm saying it in front of collectors because to really stress the importance of, you know, being really generous with these pieces to be able to be mm -hmm. seen by other people. Because, yeah. yeah. you know, know. It's, it's, it's great when you go into someone's home and you see something and I understand how nice, I mean, I have some amazing pieces in the collection, is my own collection, but, and here I am, like, talking shit because I don't think I've ever lent out anything from my own collection. <laughs> but, um, but I think that's an yeah. important component to that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, whether it's the actual lending, it's just more about the thought about these objects Keeping and what and they protecting. mean, yeah, yeah. right? So yeah, what yeah. they might mean later or how, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, we sort of determine what their life is right. so that they yeah, have yeah. a life longer than right. this Beyond immediate moment. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Absolutely. that's what's most important. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. <laughs> Uh, just thinking about how, once again, the, um, the budget for our country is zeroing out the NEA. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are those of us who will fight for funding. Mm -hmm. Where do you see funding coming? And you're mm -hmm. talking about, was it Mark de Suvaros? Mm -hmm. Space. I mean, that sounds like we need one of those <clears throat> in every small city mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the country that provides mm -hmm. the, the leadership, a space yeah. to work, a space to show things, yeah. share things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't know where that, that funding and mm -hmm. money is going to come from mm -hmm. because it's so hard to make people understand how important art right. to this crowd. Yeah. 
but to others. I thought, that, I thought every seat would be mm -hmm. taken. Mm -hmm. My friend got here early. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Save yes. the seat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I just love yeah. both of your thoughts mm -hmm. on what is such a deplorable time yeah. and, and a time when we need art and we see mm -hmm. people pulling away from the funding. Hmm. Well, I, I think we see some kinds of funding disappearing, but we also see many people who understand the need for the art at this stuff. moment, right, who understand right. the role of artists, who understand the possibility of what engaging with art can mean for individuals and communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's making a lot of the work that happens now possible. I think this moment has actually sharpened people's ideas of the mm -hmm. importance of it, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. we are not sort of in a moment where it just seems like one more nice thing next to a lot of other nice things that create this wonderful life, but a real necessity. I mean, I live and work in a community where the idea of when we sort of talk about inequity in our culture and how we begin to address it, of course, we are talking about big issues, about education and health and economic disparity, but we're also talking about how we can offer the opportunity for people to feel their humanity, to understand the possibility of their own sense of wonder and awe, how they can experience joy, how they can experience themselves and each other in mm, community mm -hmm. with people. And that's what arts institutions do do. This right. is what we do. And so I think that in this moment, we actually have a clear and exact charge that in many ways is being responded to and making it possible to do the work mm -hmm. that you know mm -hmm. many of us have been committed to for so long. Yeah, and I think, you know, in some ways that sort of removal and being stripping down, I mean, you think of the Art Institute in Detroit and kind of where they came to this precipice of having to really dissolve a lot of their collection and how, you know, people really kind of got raised up in arms and realized that, you know, if, if you know, our government's not going to do that, then we all need to be responsible for maintaining these institutions. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's an interesting time. And then again, you know, getting back to places like Socrates Park, you know, I think, you know, that happened in a way that there, it was just serendipitous in terms of that property was available. Mm -hmm. But I know that there's places here, you know, and that there's a lot of people that are kind of looking to kind of start up other things like that. It's, yeah. it's problematic in terms of real estate in places like Los Angeles. There are no disused lots sort of thing. But, um, and I think even the city also understands the need for um, having these spaces yeah. that can just be grow into these other things. So, yeah. but it is a, a matter of us all kind of, you know, stepping up. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and just being part of this conversation, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. about the place of culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in our world. Allison, again, congratulations on these Thank two amazing so presentations much. and oh, all the work so that's sweet. happening at okay. this moment. It's Thank been a you. pleasure. Thank you all Thank for you. coming. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Our pleasure. Yeah. And thank you, L.A. Louver, for hosting this as That's well. That's right. And thank you, Freeze, for instigating it. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah.